Hey guys, Montel here, and thank you so much for tuning in to this edition of Let's Be Blunt with Montel, and I am so excited about having the guest that I have on today, and we're going to get to her in just a minute, but I wanted to do something a little special because our guest is, is just uh, multi-topic, um, not just here to talk about cannabis, but here to talk about herself, her journey, her life, and why she is so impassioned about helping other people, and it bodes well and rolls right into a discussion about cannabis. So we're definitely going to uh, address that with her. But I wanted to read something to you. And, uh, you know, forgive me if I sound a little too theatrical when I do so, but let me read this to you. Not like the brazen giant of Greek fame, with conquering limbs astride from land to land. Here at our sea washed sunset gates shall stand a mighty woman with a torch, whose flame is imprisoned lightning, and her name Mother of Exiles. From her beacon hand glows worldwide welcome, sorry, from her beacon hands glows the imprisoned lightning, and her name is Mother Exiles. From her beacon hand glows worldwide welcome. Her mild eyes command the air bridged harbor that twin cities fame, frame. Keep ancient lands your storied pump, cries she. The silent lips give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free the wretched refuse of our teeming shore. Send these, the homeless, tempest-tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. Those are words from the New Colossus, written by Emma Lazarus, November 2nd, 1883, that are enshrined on the side of Lady Liberty, the Statue of Liberty. And I read those words today. Really angered by an article I was able to read in the New York Times. An article that discusses the fact that there are children from Central America being sent across the border to Mexico where they have no family. An eternal email said that this translates to our government own or this this transfer has violated our own government's policies. U.S. border authorities have been expelling immigrant children from other countries into Mexico, violating the diplomatic agreement with Mexico and testing the limits of the immigration and child welfare laws. The expulsions laid out in sharply critical internal email from senior border patrol officials have taken place under an aggressive border closure policy, the Trump administration has said is necessary to prevent the coronavirus from spreading here in the United States. But they conflict with the terms upon which the Mexican government agreed to help implement the order, which were that only Mexican children and others who had adult supervision could be pushed back to Mexico after attempting to cross the border. Our government's taking children, small children, without any representation whatsoever putting them on buses and planes and shipping them into Mexico and saying, you do this. We don't want them. And I read the Colossus first because I'm at a loss. I'm lost even today, recognizing that, you know, in some ways there are several people in this country who are breathing a sigh of relief, thinking that things are going to change in America because we are at the precipice of probably the most meaningful election in the history of this country where we are voting out a person who was a tyrant who implemented so many grotesque laws and, 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 and ideas, put them in motion to do nothing but hurt people. Yet at the same time, we breathe a sigh of relief. I'm gonna tell you, suck in a deep breath of oxygen to make sure you have the energy you need to continue to fight. Over 63 million people voted for this guy. Get that straight, that's, that's right now, he's borderlining five to seven million more than voted him in last time. 
That's close to one half of this country that still believes in this man's vile behavior. Lindsey Graham had the audacity to say, me being voted back in proves that what I'm doing is right. No, it doesn't. It just proves that there are enough people that agree with your hate-filled attitude. And I'm sorry. There are those who have told me already today, I've been in arguments with people who are friends, foes, people who agree, disagree, You've been in arguments and discussing this with people who are saying, see, Montel, they finally proved that this has nothing to do. And, you know, what, what this, this vote proved is that, you know, this wasn't about race. Lie. I believe this still is about race and this will be about race for the rest, for my time left on this planet. I believe that this is about selfishness. I believe that, you know, as we have laid a brand on this current president as being narcissist, this is just show the narcissism of our population. This has shown the narcissism of our society. This has shown us now. I fear more now than I feared before, to be absolutely honest with you. The fact that the number of people who came out in droves to say, no, 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 we want to keep him. Makes me fear what's going to happen over the next four years, because now we still have a Senate that's there divided, a Congress that's on one side, a Senate on another side. And is anything going to get done? I sure hope so. I truly do hope so. And it's, uh, you know, this is Let's Be Blunt. So I'm here to talk about our views on cannabis. And I think that everybody in this country should be applauding the fact that cannabis did so well. Cannabis did well, did really well during this election. I believe that by the time the council are done, we'll have four to five more states that now have implemented some sort of a cannabis law. Incredible. Arizona, I believe, is the first state to implement both legal recreational or adult use and medicinal at the same time. So I, I think we need to applaud and say, yay. As we get mired in our haze and our high, let's not forget that the good fight's not over and we have to continue to fight. Well, our guest today calls herself the slop. I thought that was a really cute way to, to, to change and put a twist on, you know, uh, a term, an acronym, but second lady of Pennsylvania. She founded the nonprofit Free Store 15104 and co founded For Good PGH and also 412 Food Rescue and has spearheaded many other nonprofit initiatives. She's an advocate for women's rights, immigration reform, the LGBT community, and cannabis legislation. I am so honored to have on Let's Be Butler Motel. Ms. Giselle Fetterman. Mrs. Giselle Fetterman, thank you so much for being here. Welcome to Let's Be Blunt with Montel. Thank you so much for being a part of today's show. I'm so honored to be here. I grew up watching you on TV. This is exciting. Oh, <laughs> thank you so much. That, that, I don't know if that's a good thing. It's a, yeah, it's a good thing, but it also ages me quite a bit. So thank you. Thank you so much for what you grew up on. I'm glad I helped. Now, you know, you have a very, very interesting background and story, and I'd like you to share a little bit of that before we start getting into the meat of some of the issues that I want to talk about, because I got so many to talk about with you, girlfriend. I mean, did you know that the state of Pennsylvania was going to end up being uh, literally the tipping point in this year's election? Did you have that feeling? You know, being a battleground state, we know how important we are. And, um, you know, we are always kind of that state with each election. In this case, it's it's more, right? The whole world is looking at Pennsylvania to kind of save this. Um, and I believe we're going to we're going to do it. And I think when you say the whole world is looking, the whole world is going to be looking for the next couple of weeks because, you know, there's going to be lawsuit after lawsuit after lawsuit, litigation, after litigation. And at the end of the day, the people have spoken. Right. right. It's true. But thank you for having me. Yeah. So I, you know, I'm a former dreamer. You know, when you read the Statue of Liberty, it always makes me very emotional. I, you know, we came here as a young immigrant family. My family was undocumented for almost 15 years. So mm -hmm. when you speak about children in these situations, that could have very easily been my family. 
Um, and so it's very hard. It's very hard to live in this world where you have so many amazing people who embraced me, who have helped me. And then I have a hundred, um, you know, hate mail a day telling me to go back to my country. And I live in this world where these things exist at the same time. And it's, it, it's hard. It's hard to process that. It's really crazy. I mean, I, I just, I, let me back up and where, where did you, when your family first came to the United States, where, where did you settle in? New York. So we moved to Queens and my mom in Brazil, you know, had a PhD and ran hospitals and we arrived in New York and she worked as a domestic worker. She cleaned houses and hotels and we were ESL students. I mean, we really truly lived the complete, you know, American dream um, experience. And, you know, I'm very open with my story because when I was a kid here, I needed that story. Like I needed to look for hope and no one shared those stories. So I didn't, I didn't find that hope as a kid. I was scared every time there was a knock on my door because I thought that was it. You know, that's it. We're getting deported today. And I lived with that fear for a very long time. I think I still have moments I feel it kind of creep up um, because you don't turn it off. You know, when I left for school every morning, my mom would say, I love you. Have a great day. Be invisible. And I heard that every single day of my life for almost 15 years. Um, so you don't turn that off. <laughs> it still kind of lives in me a little bit. But then again, it lives in you a little bit, but you're not invisible because you've co-founded and, and founded so many nonprofits, which are, you know, I know you're very, very proud of that are out there in the forefront, helping as many people as you possibly can. Is that been a driving force of you since you were young also? It is. And for me, you know, I, I thought of things that would have helped my mom. You know, I was raised by a single mom. We struggled. And I thought of things, what could have helped her? But I also came to this country with these fresh eyes, right? So I saw everything as new. And being an immigrant and having lived that experience gave me a really unique perspective. We were dumpster divers. So I saw what retail stores discarded. I saw how much waste America had. You know, overnight, I came from this, you know, third world country to this new country of disposability. Everything was so disposable here. And for someone who grew up here, maybe that's very normal. But for me, it wasn't. I was shocked at the waste and excess that I saw. So, you know, all those years that I was invisible, I if I saw an injustice or something that I thought could be done better, I couldn't do anything about it. But I kind of kept these stories in my head in hopes that one day I was in a position to actually do something about it. And when you talk about a disposable society, we still are a disposable society. We throw away so much. And my, just when I was talking about this new, I'm sorry, it almost brings me to tears because I can't fathom that we have people who literally will treat another person's child this way and not understand that I, there's something called karma in this world. I mean, I don't care whether you believe in, in this God, that God, you believe in this religion or that religion, you know, if you just believe in the basic ideas and, and, and rudimental fundamentals of science for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. When you can treat a human being so, so poorly as this government has done across the board, and you treat children this way, the least of us, there is nothing that's going to stop that big circle from coming back around and smacking you upside the head. Yeah, I mean, these are crimes of humanity. And, and that's, that's what this administration has supported and has started. These are crimes against humanity. And this idea of disposability, it absolutely applies to people. It doesn't apply just to things. There are people living here in this country that absolutely feel disposable, that they have been discarded. Right. And I know you stand up for them. Out of all the nonprofits that you have been involved in, which one are you, would you say you're most proud of? Um, you know, I think, well, the free store is a really special place. It's a place that you can come and get whatever you need and it's dignified and it's loving, you know, growing up and having the whole experience, seeing friends that were at the food bank, you know, you had to prove your need. You had to provide your taxes. Mm -hmm. You had to jump through all these dehumanizing 
um, loops to prove that you're hungry or that you need something. And I, I really, I don't believe in that. And, you know, I believe in people. I believe that if you expect the most out of people, they're going to rise and meet your expectations. So I wanted to create a space that was unique and it was dignified. If you came and we had something that you needed, it's yours. You don't have to prove that you need it, right? We, we trust each other. We are neighbors. We should care for each other. So I'm really proud of that work and for good as well, you know, for good, you know, we believe women will save the world. And if you invest in women, you, you will invest in families. So we do a lot of work to, to support women. Um, so I'm grateful I get to do this work and I get to cry as much as I want to and be as smushy as I want and still be effective. You know, I, I struggle that my voice isn't as loud or as firm as so many. And um, for a long time, I worried that I couldn't make an impact because I'm not that person. Um, but I've been able to do it in my way, in my gentle way, um, and really be true to myself. How did you meet your husband? I was at a yoga retreat, and in the in the lobby, there was an article about this city named Braddock. And I, at the time, lived in New York and was in love with the Brooklyn Bridge. I thought mm -hmm. it was just the most beautiful bridge in the world. And this article spoke about this abandoned city, this community that had contributed so much to this country and then was essentially disposed of. And in the article, I learned that the steel that built the Brooklyn Bridge came from Braddock. And I thought it was a connection. And I wanted to visit and get to know this city. And I arrived. And of course, he fell madly in love with me. So here I am. <laughs> <laughs> And I mean, so talk a little bit about your journey with him, your, your husband being a lieutenant governor. I mean, you've got a, uh, you're in such a unique kind of position where you're not the first lady, but you are the second lady. And, you know, there are things that people look to you for and things that people would wish that you stayed away from. Right. But, you know, after living as an invisible person for 15 years, I'm going to live exactly as I believe and you know my focus is really on the things I, I really care about and I'm passionate about whether that's immigration whether that's criminal justice reform lgbtqia rights you know cannabis um i'm i don't shy away from that you know not having a voice for so long makes you so grateful to have one so that's i use it every chance i have let's do that. look you know i gotta i gotta this time is running by so quickly i didn't realize it goes fast, but I got to pay a couple of bills. Let me take a little break. And then when I come back, let's talk about your involvement in cannabis and, and why you're involved in cannabis. I think it's very interesting and people should hear that uh, directly from you. So I'll take a little break and we are joined today by, you know, the second lady of Pennsylvania, Giselle Fetterman. And again, thank you for your state. Yay. Thank you for your state coming up and stepping up to the plate. We'll take a break. We'll be back right after this. Hi, guys, again, and thanks so much for tuning in to this edition of Let's Be Blunt with Montel. And our guest today is the second lady of Pennsylvania. She, you know, <laughs> affectionately calls that title slop, <laughs> which I think is really But she is the founder of multiple nonprofit organizations from Free Store 15104 to co founding Good uh, for Good to co founding Food Rescue. And she spearheaded many other nonprofit organizations. She is an advocate for women's rights, for immigration reform, for the LGBTQ community, and cannabis reform. So please, again, thanks so much, Giselle Federman, for joining us today. Let's be blunt with Montel. Thank you so much for having me. I'm having a great time. Absolutely. And, and, well, tell me a little bit about your journey with uh, cannabis. When did this all begin? Sure. So, I mean, I've been in Pennsylvania now for 13 years. So, um, you know, I had these experiences as a child, you know, my furniture all came from the curb. Um, I saw grocery stores throwing out perfectly good food in dumpsters that we rescued. And I was able to kind of collect these experiences. And when I was in a position to, to put all that into, into action, um, that's what my work was on. You know, my work is based on that experience, but also gratitude that I now get to live in a country where I feel safe most of the time. And I get to work every day towards a better, a better world. Well, what, what drew, what, what drew you to cannabis itself? Now you, you are a uh, medical cannabis user, correct? Mm -hmm. Correct. I uh, suffer from chronic pain. I was in a horse riding accident as a child and then 
a few car accidents and um, it's been a lifelong of chronic pain. Um, when I look back at pictures, I'm in pain. Every single photo I remember being in pain. And I experimented with cannabis in high school, you know, and in college. Um, but a medical cannabis has been life changing for me, you know, for the quality of my life. I've tried all the things, you know, I have an inversion table, I have all the right stretches and, and none of them work every day, every day, one thing helps a little bit, but medical cannabis has been the thing that has really, um, drastically improved the quality of my life. That's been a, been a similar journey with me, especially when it comes to, you know, the experimental when I was in school and I stayed away from it for, almost 20 years while I was in the military. And then, you know, when uh, my MS symptoms started creeping back, you know, I started initially moving down the path towards opioid addiction. And it was cannabis that I think saved me from that because I found relief there. And that's been the relief that has helped me. You've, have you, I'm sure that you've got to be getting some pushback from the masses when it comes to cannabis use being the second lady in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, right? Yeah, I mean, I'm regularly referred to as like the pot head second lady. Um, you know, a lot of people blame me for my husband being so vocal and trying to get uh, recreational legalized as well. Um, I'm fine to take the arrows. Um, I think it's that important and and um, I'm happy to be the person um, on that side of it. So and I believe that when you look at the way cannabis laws have been implemented across the country, are you satisfied or would you like to see some changes as the way they've been done? I mean, I'm, I'm optimistic seeing all the ones who just passed, you know, South Dakota, I think South Dakota and, you know, Pennsylvania really needs to catch up. So I'm optimistic in seeing the, the movement, New Jersey moved. And now, you know, mm -hmm. we just continue to work harder to make sure that Pennsylvania is next. And right now, Pennsylvania does have a medical cannabis law, right? It does. It has medical cannabis. Mm -hmm. And you, you, I think you said something about you were one of the first people to get your first medical, get, a, get one of the first medical cards that was uh, issued, right? Yep, I was the first round of them and went public with it right away. Absolutely. And again, you know, this, this, this thought of, you know, the pothead second lady, come on. I mean, um, what do you say to people when they say that to you? Do you try to educate them? Do you try to, you know, give them some information, make them understand that this has been a medication that's been around for close to 5,000 years, been covered in every single cornucopia of, medicine since the man started writing down information about medicine what do you say to i do but the stigma is still very present you know i still regularly have people who will stop me and say you know thanks for sharing your story you just don't look like a cannabis user well what does one look like right and i've had folks that say thanks to you sharing your story i've had the courage to apply and now i've had all this relief so the stigma really hurts. It's keeping so many people behind who are fearful of going for it, for something that will improve their lives, you know? And here I work closely with Narcan, you know, I do a lot of Narcan distributions and I've seen opioids and, and, and the path that it takes you on and, and how that's the first option for so many people instead of going for something that came from the earth um, with zero uh, negative, you know, outcomes. It, it's the stigma that really is still a challenge that we have to work through. And do, what do you think about the fact that there's such a lack of diversity and diversity in the entire cannabis industry nationwide? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I've seen a rise in women. You know, I support a lot of the women uh, groups that are doing this work, but still people of color are absolutely not a part of this conversation and it, it has to change. I've seen some states that have done the work to make sure that they're included, but that's not something you see across most of the states by any means. Absolutely. And and now you just, Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania didn't have it on the ballot this time around, right? No, Pennsylvania can't put things on the ballot. It has to be voted in order to be on the ballot. So it has to be legislatively pushed. And, and so has there been any movement in expanding the program in Pennsylvania? So John and I are hammers. We're constantly hammering the topic. Uh, we have a few Republican legislators that are the block and we are constantly urging, you know, our constituents to, to really push for it. But my husband went on a national, on a statewide tour and overwhelming the support is there. It's just legislatively, we have the blocks um, with the elected officials. I know I came in and did a little bit of, uh, of uh, lobbying in Pennsylvania, 
to see if I can push forward. So, you know, let me know when and, and you guys are moving anything like that. And I'll try to see if I can get there, especially once the you know, crisis seems to go down a little bit. So let me ask you, what do you think about the next couple of months and the next year and then the next four years? I mean, it looks like, you know, it's going to be all over but the shout and, you know, it'll take probably about a month. Yeah, God cross. <laughs> uh, but it'll, it'll take probably another month, but then it'll be all over the shout. And we could be at least looking at a path to some slight changes. What do you think those changes may look like? Right. I mean, the healing is going to begin, right? It's, it's going to, we have a long way to go. There's a lot of healing to happen to get to a better place. But I think the energy of this country is really going to change. It's, we're really going to be energized. Um, and there's going to be a momentum shift. I really believe that. And, you know, we're, we're going to elect someone who cares about people, who is compassionate, who doesn't make fun of people, who isn't uh, an absolute monster. I mean, I don't know how many ways can we, you know, how many words can we put it in? But, you know, at least with immigration, like we talked about earlier, you know, Joe Biden has a hundred day plan in the first hundred days. This is what I'm going to do in regards to immigration and that it addresses the children that we have in cages. I mean, we have children in cages. I know what a stain in our, in our history of our country. It's so strange when you say it like that, it seems just so clear that, you know, come on, we need to stop having children in cages. Yet when you hear some on the other side argue, well, we didn't build the cages. It's like, excuse me? How do you justify that? You know, and I like I get called the illegal regularly because I was undocumented and and they'll say things like you broke the law. They'll say to my husband, your wife broke the law. I mean, so it's it's justified, right? Like like they they find a way somehow in their minds to justify the cruelest of cruelest behavior. And I I don't know how you sleep at night knowing that you're ruining families. Especially when you pick up some term like, you know, you broke the law. Well, this country was filled with people who broke the law, you know, in the 1930s and the 1940s. They just happened to be of a different hue than you and I and people like us. And, I, you know, it brings me to that, that question. That the fact that people have the audacity to say to you what they say to you. I mean, I read that story. I was completely blown away, uh, you know, last month when I read the story about the woman who confronted you, I guess, in the grocery store and came and called you the n-word i'm like you know first off if you're gonna be a racist at least you know, try to direct the racism in the right direction what you know it, it, it you know for those who know don't know what happened could you just and i hate to make you relive this experience but you know point out what happened you were in a grocery store minding your own business right <laughs> Thank you. So I usually have security detail because of my husband's position. Um, but it was a late Sunday, the grocery store is three minutes from my house. And I ran to get some kiwis and I was in line to pay one item. And she walked past and recognized me and just began the rant that I am a, I'm a thief. I don't belong here. You're an N. The first thing she said, she said, there's that N word that Fetterman married as if I like ruined his bloodline or, or something was kind of the implication. Um, and she just repeated it and followed me outside of the store. And I was able to capture the few last ending of, of the confrontation. Um, I, again, I, I'm, I'm listening to you and it blows me away. You're standing there by yourself doing nothing except for looking at a cash register and probably reaching in your purse, trying to find your money. And this woman walked past you. Did you notice her when she walked past the first time? So she walked past and, and she stopped and looked at me and like huffed. So immediately I knew that she recognized me or, you know, it, it didn't seem like a positive, her body language was not positive towards me, but it's this shock. And I guess I'm naive in some ways, but like to know that someone who doesn't know me personally, right. I've never been unkind to anybody in my life could have such hatred in her eyes towards me just because she knew that I wasn't born here, you know, that she saw me as inferior, but it was hatred. It was anger to, towards someone that she had never known personally or had a conversation with. And that to me is so sad. It's just so sad. And it's just so, I'm telling you, I think there's such a large percentage of people out there that 
you know, maybe they're just, it, it was what happened to you that keeps them from doing this to another person because they don't want to end up on the news and having to explain to their own family that they were so ignorant that they stopped and said something, but it's still in their heart. I know. And that makes me sad. And, you know, I have three young kids that I'm raising to love everyone and, and treat them the same. And then I'm, it makes me think, does this woman have children? Did she raise grandchildren? Is she influencing them? What is she teaching them? And then you get in this like depression, right? Because you don't want to believe that this is going to continue. You want to believe the cycle ends somewhere, but it doesn't necessarily. When this happened, then this happened again a month ago. So a month before the election, would, would you, was there an outpouring of support or did you get an outpouring of both support? And, and well, she told you what she should have told you. Did you get a lot of that too? No, it was definitely support. I mean, there were a few like, well, you were illegal, you know, but that was very much the minority, overwhelmingly supportive, embarrassment, apologies on behalf of the country. You know, that's what represents America. That is the majority. Okay. And how did your husband respond to that? I'm sure he wanted to go down and punch that one in the mouth. <laughs> I mean, I... I don't do well in situations like that. I'm, I'm not a confrontational person. I honestly just started to cry. I was frozen in the moment. And like and I we, came home like, hmm? I'm sorry, but before you said, we should say you just went ahead and left the store. You didn't pay for your item, right? You left the store. No, I paid for my item because I was next. And she right. would say a few things and then she would walk around and then she'd come back inside the store. She wasn't yelling. She was just speaking and degrading. It's when I, I paid, when I didn't see her anymore. I went in my car and as I'm backing out of my car, she rushes out of the store. And at this point she's yelling at the top of her lungs, you're an end, you're an end. Um, and that's when I was able to capture a few seconds of her as I was leaving. Cause I, I mean, I was crying, you know, I, I don't, I'm not tough. I'm not a tough guy. I, um, I was really just frozen because at that moment, I, again, was an eight-year-old undocumented little kid who was scared. It brought me back. It was such a trigger um, because it brought me back to all this fear that I grew up living in. And it, it showed me that, it, you know, I'm 38. I have three kids. I have a career. I have a family. None of that matters to some people, right? It doesn't matter what you've achieved or where you come from or what you've done. Some people will always view you as inferior just because of your skin color or your nationality or any of these things. And that's that's really sad to accept that. It's Did really anybody sad. in the store say anything to her? Like, oh, knock it off, shut up, leave it alone, stop? No, because inside the store, she wasn't yelling. And we're all distanced in line. So there was some space. But the woman behind me saw what was happening and said, honey, don't walk to the car by yourself. I'll walk with you. You know, she was very lovely and supportive. And then another cashier opened. She slipped into a new cashier. I paid. I didn't see her. And I rushed to my car. Um, but I mean, people were mortified. Without a doubt, the support was tenfold. You know, um, those that agreed with her. I don't, not very many people agreed with her. <laughs> right, right, right. Well, I think it, it opened up some eyes, you know, even though it was a month before the election, it opened up some eyes that people would make them realize that, you know, what people of color say about how they are, you know, attacked and confronted in public, it truly happens, especially when it happens to the second lady of the state. Come on now. Right. Yeah, it very much really happens. And um, no one is immune to it, right? If you fall under this category of other, you're not immune to it. No one is. Yeah. Right. Now let's talk a little bit about um, your connection with Miss with uh, Antoine Antoine Rose. He's a black young man who was fatally shot by police in Pennsylvania. Um, you got involved in that case, did you not? At the free store, you know, we volunteer different uh, local folks, volunteer residents, and Antoine was one of my kids. You know, he messaged me. He was 15, beginning of the summer, saying, hey, I'd love to volunteer. And I have this several really beautiful emails from him, just sweet. And this 15-year-old who wanted to volunteer for his summer, right? Something that you don't see. That's not very common. Right. So he was one of our volunteers. He was the kid that would chase my kids around and tie their shoes because um, he didn't want them to trip. And... He, you know, we have a big like plaque in honor of him at the store. Um, our volunteers all remember him and 
We share stories about him. Talk a little bit about what happened so everybody knows, can put it in perspective. Sure, Antoine um, was, uh, it was a traffic stop. There was a, a shooting, police was involved and he was running away from a police stop and he was shot in the back three times and killed. And he was, was he in the car? Right, so the car was stopped. There were two young men in the car, one being Antoine. And as they ran away, um, Antoine was shot in the back as he was running away. And the police was uh, completely exonerated. Yep, he was. And do we know why they stopped the car to begin with? There was suspicion of a shooting that the car had been involved with. So the, the car matched the description. And it proved out that that was not the car. I don't know the specifics. I think there was some involvement, but it wasn't Antoine. Got it. And, you know, I'm sure that, you know, the community came out. I remember the community did come out and they exonerated the police officer. How has that left you and your, your nonprofit? I know, you know you said you've got a sign, you've got a picture of him there, kind of like a little monument to him, but I mean, how has that left the community? devastating i mean i'm very close with his mom and his sister they're incredible they really pour their energy into you know working for other other families and trying to avoid disrupting the violence from happening they they have become they have emerged as these really powerful figures um using that pain to try to end this put a change to this and i'm so inspired by them um but it was a devastating loss to our community Absolutely. So well, what can we expect from you now, from you personally in the next couple of couple weeks or next couple of months? You know, pouring love into this world, trying to help with the healing. Um, I'm always working at one of my places or chasing after my kids. And, um, you know, I love this country. I love this country so much. I just want to see it um, go towards um, what was written in that Statue of Liberty. I want to become a place where we welcome people with open arms, where we love our brothers and sisters, regardless of what they believe in and what color they are. And um, I really want to, us to lift up to that. Well, keep me posted on all your advocacy when it comes to cannabis in the state of Pennsylvania. And I'd love to come back and help out if I can. I work very closely with you know, uh, uh, DPA and um, uh, the Drug Policy Alliance and several other organizations, just trying to make sure that we can get and make sure we maintain access to you know, good and efficacious medication for those who are looking in that direction. So reach out to us. And you always have a home here on Let's Be Blunt with Mato whenever you want. Um, what's your favorite uh, form of cannabis? How do you use it mostly? Um, so uh, the pens. I have a pen and a pod. I use those a lot. I recently started using a lot of the topical I, things as well. I think a, a mix of them work um, really well for me. It's, I alternate. It's not always the same thing. I have a few that I kind of go to. Um, but they've helped my life so much. You try to consume CBD every day? Every day. Every day. It's absolutely. That's one of the things that I make sure people understand that, that you know, CBD is not like taking an aspirin once a week. CBD is something that you need to keep your system, your 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 endocannabinoid system really um, saturated, I believe. And a lot of people, if you just look up and read, you'll understand why we even talk about something like the endocannabinoid system. But I can't say enough. Thank you so much, Giselle, for being here. I know you got a heart out. Um, again, you have home here anytime you want, and we really appreciate you being a part of Let's Be Blunt with Montel. Thank you. I appreciate it. Can I share one quick story, Montel? Is that okay? Yeah. Sure. So I did an interview recently, maybe in the last year, and they asked me, had I ever been starstruck? They're like, you meet all these people. Have you ever been starstruck? And I said, yes, once at an Atlanta airport where Montel walked past me. <laughs> I'm going to send you the clip because it's adorable. Um, so yeah, so we met at an Atlanta airport, but you don't remember. That's okay. <laughs> oh, oh, that's crazy. That's insane. Thank you. I, I hope I was nice. You are very nice. I'm gonna send you. You'll see. It's really cute. <laughs> Super. Thank you. you take Thank care. you for having me. Absolutely. Take care of yourself. Hug those little children. I saw one of them in the background. You look really beautiful. And tell your husband uh, good luck for the next couple four years, five, six years. What? Well, how long is he still in turn? He has two more years to go in this role. And is he going to go after being reelected? 
We'll see what happens next. <laughs> Good luck to you. Take care of yourself. Thank you so much for being a part of Let's Be Blunt. Thank you for tuning in today to Let's Be Blunt with my talk. Thank you.